la révolte gronde Dans ce monde on n'avait pas notre place On n'avait pas la gueule de l'emploi On n'est pas né dans un palace On n'avait pas la CBA papa SDF chômeurs ouvriers Paysans immigrés sans papier Ils ont voulu nous diviser Faut dire qu'ils y sont arrivés Tant que c'était chacun pour sa gueule Leur système pouvait prospérer Mais fallait bien qu'un jour on se réveille Et que les têtes se remettent à tomber On lâche rien On lâche rien on lâche rien, 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 on lâche rien. Il nous parlait d'égalité, et comme des cons les a crus, démocratie fait moi marrer, si c'était le cas on l'aurait su, que pèse notre bulletin de vote Face à la loi du marché, c'est qu'on est chers compatriotes, mais on s'est bien fait baiser. Et que pèsent les droits de l'homme Face à la vente d'un Airbus, au fond il n'y a qu'une seule règle en somme se vendre plus pour vendre plus. La République se prostitue sur le trottoir des dictateurs. Leurs belles paroles, on n'y croit plus. Nos dirigeants sont des menteurs. On lâche rien, on lâche rien, on lâche rien. C'est tellement con, tellement banal De parler de paix, de fraternité Quand des SDF crèvent sur la dalle Et qu'on mène la chasse aux sans-papiers Qu'on jette des miettes aux prolétaires Juste histoire de les calmer Qu'ils s'en prennent pas aux patrons millionnaires Trop précieux pour notre société C'est fou comme ils sont protégés Tous nos riches et nos puissants y a pas à dire, ça peut aider D'être l'ami du président Chers camarades, chers électeurs Chers citoyens, consommateurs Le réveil a sonné Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this SWP TV live event on France in Revolt, How Can Workers Win? My name is Sophia Beach. I'm a member of the Socialist Workers Party here in Britain, and I'm going to be hosting this really exciting discussion that we've got for you this evening. We've got three fantastic speakers that I'll introduce in just a second. But first of all, I want to say thank you to everybody who's tuned in, everyone who's watching from home. Um, just to remind people or let you guys know that you can comment any questions you may have for our speakers or comments you want to make within the comment section, and we'll try and filter them in throughout the discussion. Um, and also please do share the link widely so we can get as many people tuning in and listening to what our speakers have to say today. Um, look, I'm sure we're all aware of some of the recent events that we've seen in France, an absolute explosion of strikes and protests over the last 10 weeks across the whole of France, millions of people out on the streets and record numbers of protests in some towns and cities. And what we've seen is that these protests and these revolts have gone far beyond just the question of pensions. These are revolts about the questions of democracy and, of course, about a deep crisis at the heart of not just the Macron government, but the system as a whole. We've seen students joining the protests, occupying their universities, joining picket lines, defying the police in some places. We've seen climate activists and anti-racist activists also joining the revolts and the protests as well. This fast and ex this fast paced and exciting turn of events, I think, has thrown up much bigger questions as well, rather than open over just the tactics of the strikes. There's questions such as does the movement have the power to overthrow the Macron government, or even can this revolt muster the momentum to transform into a revolution? So that with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers with me tonight. We've got people to discuss all of these questions and many more. First First up, we've got Sana Belaid. She is a French striker, a bookseller, and a member of the CGT union. So welcome, Sana. We're also jo joined by Denis Godard, a socialist and an anti-racist activist. Both Sana and Denis are um, joining us live from Paris this evening. And we're also joined by Charlie Kimber, editor of the, of the newspaper Socialist Worker, who's been reporting um, about all of the events in France over the last 
few months. So, Denise, I'm actually going to start with you for this com um, for this discussion tonight. And what I'd really like to ask is to get a bit of a bigger picture about the mood in France. You know, how significant do you think the strikes and the demonstrations have been over the last 10 weeks? Uh, the first thing I would like to say, thank you at first, uh, everybody. Uh, but the first thing I, I would like to say is that uh, maybe we have not won till now about the question of uh, the attack about pensions, but Macron has lost because the main objective of Macron through the attack on pensions was to break, to break the trade unions, to break the workers' movement, to break all the movements in France who, who have been very strong in the last 10, 20 years. Uh, so he has lost. Uh, now they try even to retreat on some other subjects just to quiet the movement, just to make people go back to work, go back to home, to leave the streets, to leave the movement. Uh, they lost on this question. And that's the main fact and the result of this uh, three months time movement now. So how significant is the movement? The movement is so strong that Macron has lost. That's the, signif the main significance of this movement. And about the other facts, you know it already, I think. You know, we will have uh, in two days time on Thursday, the 11th day, national day of strike and demonstration. It means three months, 11th day, where there were between 2 million and 3.5 million of people in the streets in France. Just to know how deep is this movement, just let's imagine there's a city, Albi, in the south of France. There are less than 50,000 people living in this, in, in this city. On the 7th of March, there were 22,000 demonstrators in this city. I mean, half of the population of the city was on the street to demonstrate against Macron. The Figaro, uh, a daily conservative, very conservative paper, just had to tell on Friday that the movement was still alive and was saying that maybe storm was still coming. And uh, they were explaining that still more than two thirds of the population is against Macron and against the attack on pensions. And, and more than 50 people are supporting the movement, not just being against Macron, but supporting the movement and thinking that the movement is going to be more uh, radical in the, in the next days and, uh, and weeks. That's the main significance. After that, we will have to talk about the dynamics because, of course, in three months' time, you know, the movement has changed. There were some turn, some... Uh, so we will have time to talk about this. But that shows how significant is the movement and how deep it is. Thank you so much, Denny. It sounds incredible. I mean, I'm going to come to you now, Sana, with the exact same uh, question. Is there anything you would like to add from what Denny has just told us? Maybe I can talk about what uh, we build in our sector, because for for why why I think it's important and relative, because um, we are a sector with no union organization who are built, we are not a sector who had um, a history of struggle or some stuff like this. It's the first time that we organize and uh, be in the demo uh, together and try to build uh, something uh, together, not uh, just about the pension, but also about, for example, uh, the salary, uh, but uh, also uh, against Macron and his capitalistic world, in fact. So it's it, it's uh, kind of impressive uh, for just to know, like for the the possibility of the the the, the, the movement. Uh, at the being, we are three people, three books in the demo with a uh, ban, uh, with a banner. Uh, I don't know, not uh, um, uh, a little. Uh, 
<laughs> stuff. I don't know, remember the, 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 the word now. But, uh, and we just said uh, bookseller in strike, and we met uh, some other bookseller, and we uh, begin a WhatsApp list, and we are, are now of more than 100 in this list. We are, uh, uh, for example, at the most important uh, demos. We are, we was um, uh, 100 people in 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 uh, in, a, uh, in uh, uh, with a banner and some stuff like this. And we have uh, some assembly every week now, and we talk about uh, organized in the uh, longer uh, period like uh, for not um, and be uh, build a struggle for our salary uh, and so it's really a victory for us and it and it's um, why i'm really agree with uh, jenny uh, but macron has already lost for in our sector for example he, he's lost he, he have lost because we organized and we uh, continue to struggle to str to struggle against him against his um, power and against uh, the the system uh, in um, in all <laughs> amazing thank you so much sana charlie i want to ask you look obviously we've been having our own strike wave here in britain for nearly up to a year now not quite on the scale of france although we would have loved to have seen it like that i'd like to ask you a similar question about the significance of the strikes in france but also the lessons that we can draw from those here in britain well, first of all, we need to understand that this is what it looks like when the working class really moves. Um, when the working class moves, it decides whether the streets of Paris are choked with rubbish or whether it's cleared. And when the refuse workers and the incinerator workers go on strike, it fills up with rubbish. Suddenly, the role of these people uh, is made flesh. The uh, electricity workers decide who gets power and who does not get power, and they can cut off Amazon or the minister's areas, if they want to. Uh, the refinery workers decide whether there is kerosene and petrol or not. The uh, chemical workers decide whether there are supplies for industry or not, and so on and so on. The port workers, the education workers, all of the signs of the power of the working class are there. And it's very, very important. The size of the demonstrations is extraordinary. Uh, as Denia Sana was saying, uh, three and a half million, according to the unions, on March the 7th. That's bigger than uh, any day of demonstrations in 1968, the great year of 68. There were bigger strikes in 68, but the demonstrations were not as big. They're bigger than the demonstrations in 1936, the great year of revolution in France. Um, this is an extraordinary event, probably the biggest fight back resistance workers movement in an advanced capitalist country since uh, the 1970s this is a very very serious demonstration of the power of the working class and it has shown that people have found a way to express the sense of abandonment by the political class and the economic elites the sense of non-recognition of their lives and the feeling that the rulers are aliens, that they're people who live in another world and don't understand what it's like to work extra years, to be expected to keep going. Uh, but more than that as well, the use by Macron of the uh, undemocratic constitution of the Fifth Republic, Article 49.3, which meant that they passed it without a vote in Parliament, set off a whole discussion about democracy, about how society is run. And Macron went into this believing that he was going to finish the unfinished business of the 1980s and afterwards, the Thatcher moment. He was going to have his Thatcher moment and to break the unions, as Denise said, as Thatcher had done in the 1980s. There was a placard I saw on uh, one of the demonstrations um, which said... Uh, a picture of Macron uh, with the Iron Lady has escaped from hell. Um, the Iron Lady Thatcher uh, has come out, uh, except that they're fighting the Iron Lady in a way that regrettably was defeated in Britain. And what we have to learn from it here is the power of resistance and then the ability of 
once strikes begin for a really big strike to spread into issues of democracy, to issues of how society is run. And for example, things like whose time is it? What about free time? What about the ability to have time off, not always to be under the whip of the boss and the government? Uh, this is very, very exciting, it seems to me. And it's incredibly full of lessons for us. And that's why it's brilliant to hear from Sana and Denis tonight. Great, thank you. Um, Sana, I want to come back to you actually for our next question first. I mean, both you and Denny have mentioned about how Macron has already lost. I guess then the question for us is then how can the workers and the movement win? Um, what do you think has been the role of the trade union leaders as a union member yourself uh, within you know, the revolt and so on? And how do you think that's compared really to the mood on the streets and the rank and file organisations that we've seen coming from below? So I'll ask you that, Sana, first, I reckon. Yes. Um... In my in my sector of activity, we don't have a, an organized union, so we don't have a leader who block us or try to 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 run the movement by by Zip or some stuff like this. Uh, we are kind of free, and we try to build it uh, in a way. So so we don't have this problem at our branch sector uh, branch level, but we have kind of problem uh, with the direction of the leader of the union at the central and the national level who uh, called to some some demos uh, some strike some day strike uh, uh, one um, day by week and it's complicated to for us to build a, uh open ended strike and some stuff like this uh, and they are like really try to control the movement by the, the up of the uh, with the leader try to contain a kind of the movement but the, and the mobilization but uh, I think uh, for example in my uh, neighborhood we have a, a local uh, uh, bureau of the union and uh, with some comrades uh, from uh, from our uh, group we try to intervene in this uh, never uh, in this uh, union uh, of the CGT, is the CGT but at a local level and with this uh, tool we can try to build some stuff with some in, uh, implantation in the neighborhood and with uh, some um, other branch uh, and some so on. So we uh, build up um, with that experience and uh, implantation uh, also, so it can help us very much. But in in the way, the direction of the union um, doesn't help. But I think they doesn't have also the um, the implantation to to organize will uh, open end and strike uh, and they don't have a button to to call it and, and push it but but they don't ha ha give us some tools to build it also so it's kind of uh, uh, pa paralyzing <laughs> i'm sorry for my english uh, situations kind of uh, and now we'll see but i think Denis uh, will um, Come back about that, but uh, they a part of the uh, union, um, the union. Uh, I don't know how he said it. It's a unity of the union. <laughs> uh, begin to talk about uh, mediation and negotiation and so on. So we'll see if what uh, they will do. But I think we have. Um, a central point who, for us, I think it's to build self organize uh, in the strike. Uh, for example, so what, it's why we try to do with our assembly every week to organize our strike, to organize our action, to organize our uh, banners action, and, and also to go see uh, some colleagues and convince them to. To, to, to come with us in the strike and, and the struggle. So I think it's wha what we can do uh, and it's uh, the more important thing to do, but we are not helped by the direction of the union. It's, it's a fact. 
Great. Th thank you. That's really interesting. Um, I'm actually going to come to Charlie then next and then Denis, because I mean, Asana, you mentioned in some senses the role of the trade union leadership has led to a little bit of a sense of paralysis in some cases. It can feel quite uh, comparable to here in Britain. But Charlie, I was wondering if you would, wouldn't mind coming in about the role of the trade union leaders, but also that really interesting network that Sana just spoke about, you know, that self-organisation on the ground. Yeah, the experience in Britain of the last nine months has been of a very welcome return to strikes, but under inadequate leadership from the trade unions. And you can have good and bad trade union leaders, left and right trade union leaders, and it does make a difference. But uh, And the ones in France speak far to the left to the ones in Britain, far, far, far to the left. Uh, and they don't have to deal with the anti-union laws, uh, or they can't use the anti-union laws as the ones in Britain can. Uh, but nonetheless, you see a common pattern. The common pattern is this, that uh, they are in the business of negotiating compromises. Uh, they try to do deals. They want to be in the room. That's the crucial thing for the trade union leaders. The problem for the French union leaders is that Macron is not prepared to compromise. He didn't say, oh, well, all right, we'll put it up by a year. Can you accept that? And they would have grabbed his hand and said, thank you very much, Monsieur Macron, and we will do a deal. Uh, but he's offering no such deal. Uh, and that's therefore is, that's, they come up, as Sana said, with talk of mediation, the talk of postponement, the talk of uh, putting it out to a referendum. Macron has shown no interest in doing any of these things for them. This places them in uh, a quandary. They're unsure what to do about it uh, because uh, they know that there's this immense pressure from below that wants to win, that wants to continue the struggle, they don't want to call the necessary action that would be required to overcome Macron and possibly to remove Macron. That would be, for example, an open-ended general strike, uh, uh, an indefinite, a renewable general strike. Uh, they, they fear to call that because uh, they don't want to upset society too much. They don't want to risk their very precious union organisation. However, that process goes along with one where you see the opportunities to build from the base. And there's no doubt that this is happening. Uh, you see the examples where by rank and file action or by the lower levels of the trade union organization that people organize mass pickets, they organize continuing strikes. Some people have been on continuous strikes since the 7th of March. And you see them pushing back against the cops and against the attempts to close down the strikes. You see this at points in the refuse workers, you see it in the refinery workers and so on. This is very, very exciting because these uh, initiatives from below to blockade cities, to continue the strikes, although they're quite small at the moment compared to the whole national picture, they give a glimpse they give a sight of the possibilities of how change can come about. One of the things that's interesting, I think, is that there are elements of the present revolt which echo that of the yellow vests in 2018, 2019. The sense of outrage, the sense of militancy, the sense of refusal to bow down to authority, the refusal to go along with just the normal methods of struggle. And partly this has infected the trade union movement in a good way, uh, sections of the trade union movement. And it means that there is the energy and initiative and confidence and militancy allied to the power of the working class. And this is what makes it so very strong. Um, the trade union leaders run away from that. They run away from that. As I say, they're much better than the ones in Britain. They sound far more to the left. They've called 11 days, as it will be on Thursday, of national action, which has put millions on the streets. But think, for example, had those 11 days been 11 days of an indefinite strike? There's no doubt at all that we would be in a deep political and economic and social crisis in France. Um, in the same way that the postal workers and the rail workers in Britain have called 18 days of strikes, but spread out over six months, nine months. And therefore, uh, there's uh, not the ability to break through. And what we have to learn from both France and uh, France, much more higher level of struggle, France doesn't do away with the question of having to challenge the bureaucracy from below, 
of having to form rank and file structures, of building strike committees, of working to strengthen the networks of resistance at the base of the unions, rather than looking upwards always at the time of those who are at the top of the unions. This, this is a very important question. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Charlie. Uh, Denny, I could see you nodding and smiling along when Charlie said, you know, imagine if those 11 days have been 11 days of indefinite strike action. So I'm going to come to you now. Is there anything you'd like to add on from what Sana and Charlie have said around the role of the trade union leaders and the movement on the ground? I, I remember I came to London, uh, I think it was in October or November, uh, as an organizer of uh, at the Stand Up to Racism conference, uh, as an organizer of uh, a large front against racism and in solidarity with migrants. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the time where there were a strike in the raffinery in France. And the government has attacked the strikers with requisition and sending the police. And uh, the trade unions called for uh, a, a sort of general, a day of general strike. And uh, when I came, I said, <laughs> I was saying, times are changing, upheavals are coming, it will not be a one day strike this time. Uh, such is the anger uh, in, the, in, in the population. Uh, I was wrong. And I, I, I remember that uh, Charlie wrote an article in a socialist worker not uh, a few days later, saying, talking about how the leadership, trade union leadership, but didn't want that. And so uh, was responsible uh, why the one day, it was just one day strike. Uh, I was wrong and it was postponed. The anger was there the roots of the crisis were there and it exploded just a few months later. Hmm. The reason, and I, I totally agree with Charlie, you know, the trade union leadership are as much afraid, frightened by the mass revolt, by the movement and the dynamic of the revolt than the government and the ruling class. Because if the movement is the dynamic of the movement is developing if there is self-activity the trade union leadership will lose their control and they you know in tomorrow the trade union leaders are going to meet with the prime minister uh, and they tell it openly they are looking and that's the word of one of the main leaders, trade union leaders, they are looking from they are looking for a way out of the situation from above. They are not looking for for a solution from below. They are looking for a way out of the movement from above. They they are troubled. They are big trouble, and that's why they launched the movement at the beginning is that because Macron launched the attack from Macron was to break the old movement and the trade union, so even the trade union leadership. So they had to respond. The way they decided to respond was a way to organize mainly demonstrations. The same trade union leaders told from the beginning they wanted to prevent strikes. They, want, they didn't want to block the country. They told it openly. So they wanted demonstration. They sold to everybody that an opinion movement, so big demonstrations and opinion polls would be enough for the government to retreat. That's why the dynamic, and for a time, people followed this leadership. They followed this line with big demonstration. And of course, there were some strikes and big strikes, maybe two or three million strikers on every national day, which is big. But mainly people were going as demonstrators. And everything changed on the 16th of March when Macron 
went, go through even without a vote of the MPs and so on. And people, at least a part of the movement, discovered that it was not enough, that they had to take the initiative. There were spontaneous demonstrations on the night. Maybe you have seen, you know, the Place de la Concorde, just in front of the parliament, thousands and thousands of people going. And some, uh, how do you say, wild demonstration everywhere in the streets. And we are still in this kind of dynamic till now. And that's why the question is, as Charlie said, the question of the self-activity of the workers, the question of indefinite strike is a question of an alternative leadership to the leadership of the trade unions. The trade union leadership is going when they will have the opportunity to do it, they will try to solve the movement. And so the meeting tomorrow, that's their big trouble, is that the movement is on much more than just the question of pensions. But the question of the pensions is the, the basic things. People will not retreat without winning on the question of pensions. That's the ambience at the moment. And the government can't accept on this point. They can negotiate on an, and retreat on a lot of things. But politically, they can't retreat on these questions. So they are blocked. Because what is needed for the trade union leadership to keep back the control of the movement is impossible for the government. So that's what opened a situation where still it's open to the dynamic of building the self-activity inside the movement. But that's now the crucial thing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Denny. Um, I just want to remind people to keep sharing the link and commenting um, in, in the comment sections. I'm actually going to stick with you, Denny, for this next question, because people have already mentioned a little bit the role of the police. Also, you know, some of the mass pickets we've used. And, you know, you just spoke about really the Macron government wanting to break the movement. And I think one way in which they've clearly been doing that is the role of the police within these processes that we've seen in France. I mean, myself from following it from social media all I see all over my social media is some of the most horrific videos of police violence and you know I just wanted to ask you you know with things like the requisition orders being sent in to smash up pickets and so on do you think that the police and state violence has been worse than usual you know I mean if you think about the climate protesters in western France I understand there's still a protester in a coma in France and some, you know, reports of people having their bones broken and being blinded. I just wanted to ask, you know, both you, um, you all of you three, really, what you thought the role of the police had been in this movement. So I'm going to come to you, back to you, Denny, for that, if you don't mind. Um, my, my, my answer at, at the moment would be yes, I know. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, Charlie talked about the Yellow Vest movement, you know, the repression on the Yellow Vest movement till now was even mm. worse. That's what's happening right now. It doesn't mean that the police is not going to do worse in the next days and weeks. You know, the first phase of the movement, big demonstrations before the 16th of March, there were nearly no, uh, there were no image of big police violence. French police is horrible. It's historical and, uh, you know, it's structural. <laughs> you know, Liverpool supporter know it uh, and can testify. Uh, but in the first weeks of the movement, they didn't use it a lot. You know, the movement was channeled by the trade union leadership, big demonstrations and so on. It changed on the, 64, in, on the 16th of March. Only on the night of the 16th of March, in Place de la Concorde. There were nearly, I think it was 300 people got arrested on the night. On the three days, the figures of the minister was nearly 900 people got arrested in the three days after the 16th of March because of spontaneous demonstration and so on. And it's, get, it's getting worse and worse. 
as you have seen about the demonstration uh, on the, I don't know exactly the words, uh, they were on the 25th of March, a demonstration against uh, a water retention project, yeah. anti-climate, anti-environment project, and the mass demonstration of 30,000 people in the countryside. And with a fucking, you know, people talked about war. You know, still now we have a comrade. It ten days time. It's still between life and death on the hospital, on coma. Uh, there were 200 people wounded. There were one grenade of different sorts launched by the police every two seconds for two hours. 200 people wounded. But it's not just on the 25th of March. In a demonstration on the 23rd of March, a trade unionist is a father. He went on the, uh, on the first lines of the demonstration because he worried about his kid, because his kid was, is a teenager. And so was going you know, on the first lines, confronting with the police and so on. And so because he worried, he, he went just to look, to try to find him. And there were some kids that were running because the police was trying to hit them. And he tried just to bring up uh, a kid that lied on the ground. And he was shot. He lost his eyes. You know, he's a father. He's a trade unionist. I think he's 45, 50 years old. He's not fighting the police just because he tried to save a kid. That's the level of violence now. And that's one of the cards of the government. But we have to be clear, they hesitate. That's, that's what is the situation right now. On one side, they retreat because they have lost and they want the movement to stop. They have retreated on different projects. There are some victory on local demands different things. They are retreating, trying to calm down the movement to make the trade union leaders to stop the movement. And at the same time, there is the authoritarian, the repressive, the racist cause. So, but for the moment, because the initiative is on our side, everything they are doing is going against them. Is going back against them. One retreat gives confidence to people to mm -hmm. say, no, we have not enough pensions. When they attack people, you know, after the 25th demonstration, there were mass pickets on two days later in every city. Thousand people in Paris. I was invited to speak. And, you know, the compared to the organizer, every radical thing against the police, against the state, against negotiation from the trade union leaders was clapped by the people. People are more on the left and every attack from the state at the moment is going back against that as a revenge. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Danine. It's, you know, it's great to hear about the resistance, but shocking as well, some of those stories you just shared. Um, Sana, is there anything you'd like to add about the role of the police on these demonstrations and, and the sort of state violence that we've seen being used against the protesters? Uh, I can talk about uh, the repression that we uh, be, we have been uh, faces in our sector. But, uh, same, uh, an example, uh, 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 from from many else but uh, we have a bookseller who was arrested and detained for four days just for nothing just to be there at the wrong place at the wrong time and uh, she is they keep her uh, four days uh, because she doesn't want to give uh, her uh, fingerprint so they try to break her but she 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 fight against and she won and uh, in, in try and so on but just to say that uh, they try to break the movement uh, uh, in with the repression and so on and police and some stuff like this maybe to, uh, to 
put an example for what uh, Denis said. Uh, it's we can say that the, um, it refers our solidarity in our uh, assembly. We are mainly uh, in front of the the. Um, uh, the the try and uh, we are organize a lot of uh, sector who are uh, come in support of our uh, camarade and so on so uh, in fact uh, it's what Denis said like um, they try to break us but it's uh, run uh, it's run force um, reinforced <laughs> sorry uh, us in fact uh, with solidarity and uh, link with some other sector and so on so we are strong than before uh, even it was uh, hard for the comrades but uh, I think uh, it's really that they try to break us with some uh, with the stick but we, we resist and we are more stronger than uh, than <laughs> than uh, than uh, them uh, right now <laughs> exactly that's great to hear um, solidarity with your Charlie I don't know if you want to come in a little bit a roll around the police and their role within the state well just very briefly I mean uh... Vladimir Lenin, the great Russian revolutionary, wrote a, a book, The State and Revolution, where he talks about the state as a special power, a class power, involving bodies of armed men uh, who are involved in naked class struggle. Oh, well, that's very crude, isn't it? What a very crude understanding of the state. Except, uh, at crucial moments, this is exactly what the state looks like. Uh, as Denis said, the environmental protest in saint Céline, de Sèvres, in uh, Western France, 4,000 grenades used, uh, and these explode. Uh, you know, they can blow someone's hand off, they can blind someone, they can kill someone. Uh, this is the scale of it. Uh, Jean Damanin, the equivalent of Suella Braverman in France, uh, talks about the intellectual terrorism of the far left. Uh, it's a deliberate policy. Um, they are dissolving one of the organizations involved in the De Sèvres protests, the uh, Soulevement de la Terre, the uprisings of the earth, um, going to be banned, just as, just as they banned Muslim organizations, nonviolent Muslim organizations were banned. This is what the state looks like when its back is against the wall. And their violence is worse, is worse because they know they're in a minority. They know that they have barricaded themselves off from the vast majority of the population who disagree with them. They've rammed this through in the most undemocratic methods possible, and they're facing mass protests, and their only way, their only hopes are the trade union leaders and the truncheon. That's their hope. Uh, and it's vicious, and it's what authoritarian rule looks like, the authoritarian hardening that goes with this phase of neoliberalism. And we're seeing it here as well in Britain. The uh, police bill, the public order act, the illegal migration bill. Interesting, many of those measures used against environmental protesters, just as they used in De Sèvres in France. This is the reality of what the bourgeois state looks like when there is protest against it. Uh, and therefore we should understand that it's a sign of weakness as well, because they can't rule simply through the method of fraud and persuasion, and therefore they turn to force against it. And the fantastic thing that's being revealed, though, is that the power of numbers and the power of working class action can defeat them, because they are very, very worried that the cops will get too tired. You know, why was uh, King Charles not allowed to go? They weren't sure what would happen if they rolled out the red carpet, whether uh, there would be a repeat of the revolutionary actions of the uh, of the French Revolution. Uh, they, they were nervous about the protests against King Charles. Why did they tell cabinet ministers not to hold public events? Because we're not sure we've got enough cops to patrol it. Uh, there's this deep feeling against the police and... The police attacks radicalized the yellow vests. They pushed them to the left. They made them more against the state. And there are hundreds of thousands of people, particularly young people in France and workers who are learning this lesson now, that the state is not on your side, that the cops aren't on your side. Uh, and this is, this is 
very, very subversive. Uh, and it's a powerful lesson, it's a good lesson to learn. But we should understand this is what the state looks like when it feels under threat. All the, the hymns about democracy and liberty and participation and everyone being involved and so on, out the window. The truncheon comes out and the gas and the grenades and the mass arrests. Uh, and we have to have a politics which recognises that they don't play the game when the game isn't useful for them. Great, thank you. Um, I just actually want to ask a question now from one of our listeners. Um, and I think it links in because obviously when speaking about police violence, one of the protests that was mentioned was the climate protesters, um, particularly against, I think the one Tenny, you were referring to against, you know, these large reservoirs that were going to be built um, in, in Western France and so on. And actually Brian has wanted to ask a question specifically to either Sana and De and, or Denny about whether or not you could sort of comment on the hearing of the climate activists, you know, what their demands um, have to do and how they can be linked within the movement, particularly around their demands to change change energy policies, you know, away from fossil fuels and actually, you know, a just transition for these workers and communities to go into sustainable economies. I mean, it would be great to hear your opinion on not just clearly the French government's complete lack of care around the question of climate change, but also, you know, what these sort of demands around a move away from fossil fuels means for um, sections of workers such as refinery workers and so on. So I don't know if there's one of you two that wants to come in on that uh, more. But I might come to you, Sana, first, if that's OK. And then, Denny, if you'd like to add anything. So over to you, Sana. It's a better with the microphone. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure I understand all the questions. So maybe I let Denny first, and maybe I, I complete if, if it's needed. Awesome, right. we'll do that. Denny, would you like to come in? No, it's, it's an incredible time when people, a mass of people are going into revolt. You know, all ideas are coming on the front. And they, of course, there are some, even, you know, there are some discussions, you know, there were the CGT national conference in the last weeks. There are some debates inside the CGT that's the trade union about the question of uh, environment, uh, the question of uh, nuclear uh, uh, plants, and so on. You know, and some debates because you know some say that you know we we have to defend our jobs and so to, to defend nuclear plants. Some say that we have to defend environment and so on. What is sure is that this debate is becoming a debate not just for uh, environmental activists, but in all the movements. And, uh, and the question, even behind this question, the, the demonstration it's in, in San Solin, you know, mainly is a question, who is running the planets? And what what are their objectives? They want to privat to privatize the water for just a minority of rich people, uh, and not for the cultivators, and for everybody. For the reason of profits, they are going to destroy the planet, and it's a political question. They are ready to use three thousand armed police to defend something which is just you know uh, a hole a large hole with nothing just to show that they keep the control they are ready to kill some demonstrators for a symbolic place just to show that they keep control and so, of course, people are thinking, what is the connection between the way they are destroying the planet and why they are doing it? And why they are attacking everybody of us? They want us to work till our death. 
They don't care about us. They don't care about our planet. Just because they care about their control, keeping control, and about their benefits. And so it opens, I don't know if it was really the question, but it opens all the debates. And it means that through what happened in San Solin, not only the movement, as Charlie said, is radicalizing about the state, the power of the state, the question of the police, the question of the violence, what means they are ready to use against us. But it opens discussions about much more generally what kind of system we want, what kind of planet are we preparing for the future and so on. There were 30,000 demonstrators, you know, in nowhere. And even trade unionists. Sorry about that, um, viewers and listeners. I was locked out of the room for a second there, but that was really inspirational to hear that, um, Denny. So and I don't know if you want to add a little bit about that question of climate, but also clearly what I said, no? Awesome. Well, I think it was quite comprehensive. And actually, Denny, I'm going to come back to you um, because I would really like to turn to the question of racism. I know that you're an anti-racist activist um, in France and some people in the comments section, um, such as Richard Gregory, have been asking about whether or not, you know, the failure uh, of Macron's government could play into the hands of Le Pen and National Rally. Um, but rather, I'd actually like to flip that question on, on its head, if that's OK, uh, with what you were just saying. You know, these movements are taking up much bigger questions, not just about climate, or pensions, but about the state and the racism that some people experience in France. And I was wondering how how far you think this revolt could undermine Le Pen's uh, popularity and some of the racism of the national rally, rally and, and, and broader society. So I'd like to ask you that question, if that's okay. You know, we, we always argue that there were polarization. The crisis of the system was leading to polarization. Polarization on the left and polarization on the right. You know, let's remember, it was just one year ago on the elections, Marine Le Pen won 30 million votes, fascist candidate. Few weeks later, 89 fascist MPs got elected on the parliament. We explain at this time, polarization. It was polarization to the right, but still there were a lot of votes on the left. There were still potential on the left. There were movements on the left, solidarity and so on. But the initiative, the picture, the polarization was going to the right. It was one year ago. You know, now polarization is on the is on the left. Fascist mainly, mainly are nowhere at the moment. They can't take really initiative. They try because they have an audience. So they try mainly on the question of immigration. But for example, they tried to organize a protest in a small city in Britain. In Britain, excuse me. Uh, there were 100 against a, a, a migrants center being built. There were 100 of them. And in, in this small city, they had more than 1,000 demonstrators against them, in front of them. Uh, so polarization on the left mean that the ground is good for us to fight fascism 
and the racism. But there's nothing, nothing is mechanical. It's just like this. You know, <laughs> in, in opinion polls, the best opponents to Macron are the trade union leaders on the polls. When you look at the political figures, the best opponent on the polls is Marine Le Pen. You know, because she, she took position against the pensions. So it means that uh, if the movement is not arguing, fighting in solidarity with migrants against racism, is not using its strength to smash the fascists every time they want to come, to organize, there will be some setbacks and the fascist will be in good position to use it. And there is, you know, we will talk about all the debates on the left and the need for the revolutionary to organize, to be bigger and so on. That is one of the questions on the left where the left is so weak on this question that it's a disaster. You know, because they think for years and they explain and still explaining that Marine Le Pen is just, just a more right-wing part of the ruling class parties. So they can't explain that Marine Le Pen take position against the attack on pensions and can look, could look, as an alternative against Macron. They can't explain this. The fascists are trying to build a mass movement, even taking some kind of anti-establishment, even anti-capitalist sometimes positions to be able to build a mass movement. And so we have to argue and to build, and it's possible. You know, we have argued and fought for weeks inside the movement to build demonstrations against a new anti-racist law that the government wanted plans to push through at the same time on the attack of pensions. It was hard fight, hard struggle inside the movement, never supported by anybody on the left and on the, on the trade union leaderships. We were going on every demonstration with undocumented migrants, with different people, leafleting, preparing demonstrations. On the 25th of March, there were demonstrations in 40 cities on the same time than saint Solin in France against this new racist law. In Paris, there were 12,000 people in the demonstrations. We know that even this demonstration opened more the, the arguments. And with, uh, you know, I gave the example, the Soulevement de la Terre invited us. The Soulevement de la Terre, they made a statement before the 25th of March to support us against the racist law. They invited us on the big picket to support them. And we launch, we are launching a new day of demonstration at the end of April because it's so crucial. You know, it's against racism, against the, the car they could use, but it's much more than that. We argue that to win against Macron, the question is class fight, class struggle, our class against them. And to be strong, to be united, to be in strong solidarity, it means that white workers have to be in solidarity with black workers, with black mi with migrants workers. Unity of our class needs a fight against racism. I finish just about Marine Le Pen. You know what? We learned two days ago from a, com a comrade that you need to have revolutionary people everywhere from a camp comrade in Le Havre. I don't know if you know Le Havre. 
you know, Le Havre is a port with a strong tradition, a workers' place, a strong tradition of, of dockers' struggle. Marine Le Pen has planned to organize a national meeting in Le Havre on May Day, the day of the workers. She will organize a national meeting in Le Havre. It looks like a provocation. For the moment, the left is doing nothing. We are going to push hard to make about Le Havre to become a uh, sort to mobilize nationally to say these days we don't want the fascists to be in Le Havre. We want the dockers to attack the fascist meetings. And if, you know, the movement opened this opportunity, if the left is doing nothing, Marine Le Pen will benefit. Thank you so much, Denin. Yes, solidarity to all of you organising against uh, Le Pen's national meeting on May Day. Sano, I could see you nodding along with what Denny was saying. Is there anything that you would like to come in and question about, you know, the importance of the anti-racist movement within the wider revolts that we're, be we're seeing in France at the moment? Yes, uh, but I can uh, explain what we do in our uh, in bookseller assembly because uh, with some comrades we argue about yeah. the unity of our class. We need everyone to win against Macron. It's why we call to the 8th March uh, the strike and we have banners at the demo and we convince that not just because the, the pension attack will uh, attack more the women, but because also we have some feminist revendication uh, 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 even else than the pension. So, and the same thing about uh, the, the migrants and about uh, anti-racist uh, movement in general, because we, uh, we argue that we, we need to be united to win against uh, Macron and to be in solidarity with all, all, all the, the struggle. So uh, we, we build this uh, demonstration. We uh, inv invite um, the March de Solidarité, the anti-racist movement, um, to come. Our in our evening, we we are organized uh, for the. Uh, for, for the bookseller and so on. So we try to make some concrete link to build it. And uh, we can see that even people who are just arrived in the activist stuff and uh, it's the first strike and so on are convinced about the, the, the necessity to fight, to fight uh, with all uh, united against uh, Macron and against um, the bourgeoisie because we 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 learn uh, uh, with the past uh, struggle that we need to be all against him uh, against Macron against his government and against his classes uh, to, to win to can win so I think uh, this argument is more uh, it's it's kind of easy in the movement in the, from below like we we, we can uh, it's really uh, easy to argue assembly and some stuff it's more difficult to argue that with some activists uh, uh, from the union some from union leaders or, or some stuff like this uh, so i think um, the people who are invest in the movement from below are really convinced of that and and, and really uh, uh, I don't know uh, how to say it. Uh, they're, they really uh, understand that the necessity of this United to can win uh, the movement, but uh, even uh, all <laughs> more than that. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sana. And look, Charlie, I just want to turn to you on the same question. We've spoken about the importance of anti-racism being tied in with the trade union struggle. I think there's lots to be said about similarities here in Britain, but also I want to hear your take around the role of, you know, an anti-racist movement to push back not just Macron, but also Le Pen. So over to you, Charlie. Yeah, I think we have to understand that a high level of class struggle opens the door for pushing back against racism and the fascists, but it's not at all inevitable. Uh, the possibility is clear in the opinion polls. If you look at the polls, they show that as many people who voted for Le Pen a year ago are for escalating the strikes, for hardening the strikes, 
uh, as there were people who voted for Mélenchon, the left candidate. Equal numbers. There's just as many people who voted for the Rassemblement National, the national rally, as voted for, for Mélenchon are for escalating the strikes. Nearly as many people who voted for the fascists are against the cops as voted for Mélenchon. Similar numbers of people. So if the movement escalates, if the movement continues to defend itself against the police, it can begin to break those people off. Because, of course, Le Pen is against escalating the strikes. And she is uh, four square with the police because the police are an important part of her base. The potential is there, right? But it's not inevitable. And what Denise said about fighting for unity is incredibly important. You see, some people say if you raise anti racism, it divides the movement uh, because we're all together at the moment. You keep quiet about those sorts of things. No, no, no. It's not anti racism that divides the movement, it's racism that divides the movement that uh, all forms of oppression, but particularly sharply around the question of racism, are a knife at the throat of working class unity. And you can't struggle effectively unless you are a militant, you're for more struggle, you're for hard struggle against the bosses in the state, but you're also raising the question of anti-racism. That's why it's brilliant to hear of the work of Marche de Solidarité and others that uh, Denis and others have been involved with incredibly important work why you have to say victory to the strikes in love and victory to the anti-fascists in love and in britain when we go on the junior doctors picket lines next tuesday and wednesday and thursday and friday uh we'll of course be talking to them about the health service and about the strikes and the, the battle for pay and so on we'll also be saying to them why people need to be against the assault on migrants against the new illegal migration bill and so on uh, when we go on the teachers' picket lines on the 27th of April and the 2nd of May, and the PCS, the civil service workers' picket lines on the 28th of April, and all the other strikes that are going on at Amazon and Dundee and so on, we argue about how the movement can win. But part of that is also an argument against oppression, against attacks on black people, against migrants, uh, defense of trans rights and so on. All of this is important. Raising women's liberation, or trans rights or anti-racism is not a diversion from the struggle. It's a central part of the struggle. And that's what we have to hope develops in France. One final word, if the movement doesn't win clearly, the dissolution and the sense of deflation will help the fascists will help Le Pen when it comes to the next set of elections. So it's very, very important that the movement escalates and wins in order to break Le Pen's hold upon people. Great, thank you for that. I think it was really important to go through those. So unfortunately, we're coming towards the end of our live TV session. There's just a final question that I want to ask to all three of our speakers. It's probably the biggest question of all, but you have a few minutes just to answer it. And I think it links in, you know, earlier in one of the comment sections, Jim on YouTube asked, how can French workers turn the strikes into a general one? Well, what I really want to ask then with that is what is the role of revolutionaries during such a time? So I'm gonna to come to you, Sana, first, Denis, and then to Charlie. So over to you, Sana. That is a big question. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe to answer, I think right now for our main activity um, must be to build a self-organization uh, from below of the movement to can uh, be, uh, can act without the the union uh, trade union leaders and to be at the initiative to keep the initiative in our side so i think it's is that and to develop uh, more the strike and convince um, more people to be active in the strike and to build it 
for example we uh, we this week we continue to go in the bookshop to convince our colleague to to go in strike to keep in strike and to build also our um, uh, ac um, uh, on action in our sector about our salary and maybe uh, um, make some action with uh, against uh, the trade union from the the bosses from the bookshop and some stuff like this to have more the initiative of our movement to not be uh, just follow the trade union leaders and build something uh, without them um, and to to not let them have the control of the mobilization. I think it's uh, one of the big uh, issue from the, uh, the anti-capitalist activists and uh, socialist activists in, in France right now, and also to have a um, um, clear line about anti-racist and uh, oppression in the movement and build solidarity between struggle and uh, sector and to 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 build this unity that we talked earlier. So I think uh, these are the, the principal uh, stuff we we working on right now. And uh, we try to, to, to reinforce the movement by, by uh, build it by below. Amazing, thank you so much, Sana. And, you know, solidarity with you and your fellow bookshop workers and, you know, onwards with the struggle, Denny. I'm gonna come straight to you with the exact same question about what the role of the revolutionary is during this time. <laughs> In reality, that's the key question. You know, when, when you have such a movement, objective factors are all there. You know, the crisis of the system, the polarization, antagonism, the question of the state, every objective factors are there. And they are, they are the ones who are creating the possibility of the movement. But when all the objective factors are there, the subjective factor is becoming crucial. What people are doing, what are they arguing for? What are the initiatives, the propositions? Debates inside the movements are not just debates. It's debate to know what, what are we doing? What are we going to do? So the first answer to what the revolutionaries are doing, <laughs> the, the first one is quite simple. Be involved. Be involved inside the movement. It's look obvious. It is not. It is not. There are so many revolutionaries who are outsider, outsiders or just coming inside the movement to say, to give some lessons. Be involved. We are part of the class. We don't want to work two years more. We want to win. So be involved. But be involved. You know, we had a lot of discussions before the movement. You know, I want to send my love to all my comrades. We are building a group. We have begun to build a new group in the last years. Happily, fortunately, it's modest. But we had the discussion before the movement. And we said, OK, if you're not involved, because it's coming, just forget it. Forget about the revolution and so on. Be involved. Second thing, don't be... In Involved just as tourists. Come with your milieu. If you're building against racism, go inside the movement in bringing the question of racism and bringing the people who organize things with you. If you're in feminist committees, collective associations, come with your fellow feminists in the fight. If you're on a workplace, be involved in the trade union, build a movement, build a strike. That's the first thing. Learn and teach. You will learn nothing if you're not involved, but you will teach nothing to people. They will not listen to you. The second thing is that the experience we are doing is that during a mass movement, a mass revolt, 
a mass revolt. There is a tendency of a sort of fusion between theory and practice. I mean, the question of theory is becoming very practical. And it's becoming practical through the question of strategy. Let me explain with one example. There is a huge debate inside the movement, you know, I mean, in rank and file milieus and so on. A lot of people, left syndicalists, revolutionaries, arguing that the key question of the strike are the strategic sectors, that the key question is to attack the capitalists on the question of money. So the, the meaning of the strike is the economic power of the workers. In some way, the autonomous currents are saying nearly the same. So the first one say, so the way forward for the movement practically is to send people to support, you know, the, the real workers, I would say, you know, raffinery, garbage collectors, railway workers, and chemical workers, you know, the image of the working class, you know, because they have the power to block the economy. We say, or the autonomous currents say, we need to block the flux. We say the flux, you know, the transport, the logistic, with activists blocking things. We are arguing that behind the question of the strike is a question of self-emancipation of the workers. The self-activity of the workers. We need, you know, I talked about two or three millions of strikers in France in the national days. There are between maybe 30 million workers. 30 million workers in France. We need to go through enlarge the strike to involve actively a majority of the 30 million workers in France. Because through the strike is a question of collective self-emancipation, of changing ideas, of taking control of society. So why I say that this kind of theoretical debate has clearly practical conclusions we don't want people from one side to Paris because it happens. And people just want to do things, to go from one side of Paris at five o'clock on the morning. And they are doing, you know, it shows the strength of the movement, the determination to go from one part of Paris to another part, to be 100 or 200 or 300 people helping garbage collectors to block. We say, what you have to do much more important Organize the strike in your workplace. Organize the connection between your workplace and the other workplace on your local area. We have some comrades involved. You know, yesterday night, there were hundreds of people demonstrating in my local area, organized through what the Interprofessional Assembly. I mean, these theoretical discussions a clearly practical discussion inside the movement. It's an opening for us because it means that you can talk about theory to everybody through the question of what are we going to do tomorrow? What is the way forward? But I want to finish. It means that sometimes you can win the argument about, okay, it's more important to organize locally, to organize the strike on your workplace and so on but you can win superficially the arguments. You have to win why. You know, you have to win on the theory that bring you to this conclusion. And so you have to win people to a revolutionary or a common organization that defend this, not only in my local area, but with Sana doing some fantastic work with bookshops, with some comrades in another area at this time, our comrade in Marseille was were very important, not only to build the anti-racist demonstration in Marseille on the 25th of March, but now 
to build a sort of interprofessional uh, assembly in Marseille. It's the beginning of self-activity in Marseille of a rank and file organization. They began 10 days ago. The first assembly, they had 500 people from different sectors. That's an embryo. That shows the possibilities. And we have some, some comrades doing this in Marseille, in Rennes. It's modest. But arguing for that, trying to take the initiative, we need to win more people like this. And there are some debates inside the movements. So that's what the revolutionary have to do. Amazing. Thank you so much, Denny. Could not agree more. And look, I'm going to come straight to you, Charlie, um, to answer the exact same question. Over to you. Yeah, our politics means that we are the champions of what's called in France massification. Uh, we want millions more on strike. We want people to feel the sense of struggle and of their own self-emancipation. That's a very important theoretical understanding which has practical importance at the moment. Sana was absolutely right about talking about the battle to grow the networks from below in two senses. Firstly, the networks from below are the way to push the trade union leaders and to block the attempts by the trade union leaders to stop the struggle. The stronger the rank and file organization, the more it is likely that a clear win is achieved and that workers go on more confident afterwards. The same argument here, the more we build strike committees, the more we build the networks from below, the less we rely on trade union leaders, whether they be left or right, the stronger the push will be for resistance now, the easier it will be to escalate, and the less likely it is that rotten deals are pushed through. That's an urgent task. But in addition, when the struggle is at a very high level, as it is in France, you have to think about arguing for a different sort of society. And the great thing about building from below and creating the networks of resistance and creating the strike committees as they are in a few places in France is that they give a vision of an alternative way of running the world, a different way of ordering society, not one with a remote and fraudulent democracy as exists at the moment, but a democracy from the base, accountable, recallable, elected by workers themselves. And the, the networks from below give a vision of that. This is why building at the base structures is good to win the strike and it's good as a vision of how we can have a different sort of society. Then we have to say what we've learned during the struggle, where does it come from? The environmental horrors, the cops, the determination to make us work longer, putting profits before people, the lack of democracy. These are not all just discrete elements cut off from, from one another. They are manifestations. They are parts of capitalism. And therefore, we need to attack capitalism, as well as Macron, as well as Damana, as well as the failures of the particular bosses and the particular po politicians. We have to go for the system itself. And here, we need to talk about organization. Because when there's a great social movement, as there is in France, the trade union leaders will have their answer. The reformists, like Jean-Luc Mélenchon, will have his answer. The uh, right wing will have their answer. The fascists will have their answer. And they will win out, not uh, spontaneously, but if our side organizes. If the revolutionaries who understand about self-emancipation, who understand about the necessity of bringing together the fight against oppression, the fight against exploitation, if they, if they organize, they can win some of those debates and potentially win all of them as the struggle develops and people learn the lessons in practice. And therefore, uh, organization is cru crucial. Revolutionary organization. I know that in France, that the movement against racism, had it not been for our comrades, would be much, much weaker. Much, much weaker. I don't say they've done everything, but they have played a crucial role in that. The bigger the revolutionaries of our type grow in France at the moment, 
the stronger will be the struggle, but also what comes after this particular struggle will be stronger. And same in Britain. We need a movement here which also takes part in every form of resistance, whether it be the XR protests on the 21st of April, whether it's the anti-racist protests, whether it's the strike struggles, that is deeply embedded in all of those forms of struggle, but at the same time raises the vision of fighting for socialism. And therefore, just as A2C is building in uh, France, uh, we as the Socialist Workers' Party need to get bigger. We need to get bigger. We need to be stronger so that in every struggle, the argument is raised about all the different forms of resistance, but also fighting against the system tonight. A very big thank you to Sana and to Denis for joining us. A very big thank you to them for speaking in English. But if you want a takeaway from this, it is that you should, if you're listening in France, you should become involved with A2C. If you're listening in Britain, join the Socialist Workers' Party to be an embodiment of all of the lessons we've spoken about tonight, about the struggle against racism, the struggle against the system, the struggle for a socialist future through revolutionary means. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Charlie. And thank you so much once again to all three of our speakers, Sana, Denis and Charlie. Look, just to finish with as well, I want to thank all of you at home for commenting and watching. I mean, just from looking at some of the comments, I've seen that we've had people tuning in from Brazil, New Zealand, Germany, Canada. So, you know, obviously this is not just about the struggles actually in France or here in Britain, but actually a global and international struggle against capitalism and all of the ills that come with it as the speakers have said tonight and I just want to reiterate what Charlie and others have said I've obviously been asking the questions this evening but if someone was to ask me what the role of a revolutionary or what the next step would to be it would be to join an organization like the SWP the Socialist Workers Party here in Britain and um, but also the A2C in France or anywhere else I think Denny made it right you know to be involved and also with what Sandra is doing is you know involved in bookshops if you're here in Britain there's a fantastic independent socialist bookshop called Bookmarked where you can buy all of the theory that you need in order to win yourself to those revolutionary ideas. The final thing I want to say is that if you've enjoyed the discussion tonight I'd like to point people's attention towards this beautiful poster behind me Marxism 2023 is an annual festival we host as the Socialist Workers Party here in London running from the 29th of June to the 2nd of July and um, you can see a list of some of the fantastic speakers we've got. Uh, no doubt we would love Senny, uh, sorry, Denny and Sana to come along with us. No doubt we'll be having discussions about the revolt in France along with uh, cultural events, live music and a real understanding about what socialism is. So thanks everyone for watching. Solidarity to the strikers, victory to the strikes and victory to the protests. Have a Brilliant evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fond de ma cité HLM, jusque dans ta campagne profonde, notre réalité est la même, et partout la révolte gronde. Dans ce monde, on n'avait pas notre place, on n'avait pas la gueule de l'emploi, on n'est pas né dans un palace, on n'avait pas la CBA papa. SDF, 